morning everyone and welcome to the Ward Valley Heritage Park. It's Don Kevel. He's taking off his cap now. <laughs> he knows this is serious. <laughs> and Mike, uh, we're just outside the main entrance to, to the estate. You feel more respectable now? Oh yeah, yeah, look. <laughs> <laughs> Today's walk is going to take us up to Noxidan Bridge. This is a walk of maybe an hour, maybe an hour and 20 minutes. And um, it's it's fairly easy going, but a very interesting uh, walk. So come along with us in a while and we'll enjoy that. Just to, just to show you a summary of the walks we've laid out. So it's the map of the walks. And as we said, the core walk, which we've done is marked out in red. The external walk marked out in yellow. And the walk we're going to take today, the uh, outer walk, the signposts for it are in white. This is the main entrance to the Ward Valley Heritage Park. It's not the only entrance. There's entrances from Noxidan Estate, uh, also entrances from Highfield, Brookdale, and on the, that part of the, the area. As we said, the metal post at the bottom of the hill is the starting point for all the walks. Um, the reason why the estate happens to be here today is because of Brackenstown House and this is the modern uh, version of, of Brackenstown House. Uh, Patrick Campbell and his wife Veronica uh, live there now but if we come back 400 years or so Chief Baron uh, John Bryce he was uh, the Chief Baron of Ireland in the 1640s and after the Cromwellian settlement he erected a house on the Brackenstown uh, uh, site. Now his daughter Judith Letitia, beg your pardon, she married uh, Viscount uh, Robert Molesworth and Molesworth laid his mark on the park by laying out many water features and a lot of ornamental masonry which we'll talk about and we have talked about already. Richard Manders is the man responsible for the Mill Bridge area and he was a businessman and a baker from County Leash. He was uh, Lord Mayor of Dublin in the 1840s he laid out a lot of the farm buildings on the estate now unfortunately uh, gone and he also operated the charges for, for the, the Glasnevin to Noxidan Turnpike Road. Uh, unfortunately in 1850 Manders went bankrupt and the estate uh, was sold. A Dr O'Callaghan, DA O'Callaghan was the next person who lived in Rackenstown House. He was a horse breeder and equine specialist and it gave Brackenstone House and the estate the great tradition of equine uh, breeding and racing uh, which it has uh, to this day. Don, I think you were involved in the horsing establishment in Harry Usher's day. Yes. Would you like I, to tell us a little about that? I, I was there for, I, I moved into Brackenstone uh, stables uh, in 1967 and I was there till 72 and I was, I was working for a trainer called David Blanford and uh, and that was when Dr Cross owned owned the yes the, the, the establishment and uh, but he he died in 1969 and the uh, he had his wife had already predeceased him and he, he he was left with uh, four children and I don't think they had an interest in running the stables as a as a business so it was sold in 72 to uh, to uh, Stephen Larkin I who, think who was, was a developer I think well it, he owned the pub or the hotel the Hawthorne Hotel in Swords I think and I think he was a developer too yeah he also built a site on the Millbridge site <laughs> right okay yeah there was concrete masonry or typical of that day yeah but, um... uh, we're, we're down now at the middle bridge and you can see the steel post which is the starting point for all the walls marked in red, yellow and white. We wanted to give you some idea of the structures that were actually on this site. They're very hard to reconstruct today. And here's a picture of the mill bridge, the mill house, a three-storey, two-gable structure that was erected just behind us over here in that particular space. Hard to believe it today as there, there's really no trace of it. Not. Here's another picture of the mill taken from another angle 
this gives a good idea of the three stories and the two gables on it, it was ivy covered. And in more modern days, he, uh, Martin Dooley lived in the mill house with his family and it became a Thai cottage uh, within, the, within the park itself. So just to fill out the picture, then on the core walk, we went up onto the bridge and we looked at some of the iron machinery left. And it's very hard to recreate what the scene was like. But this lady, this picture dates from the 1950s. And as you can see, there was a lake completely behind the uh, sluice gate mechanism. And at the back, you can see the mill house uh, with the oval opening for the water to come in. So just reconstructing what it was like here. Thank you, Don. Sorry about that, really. Thank you, Don. We're here now just about to start off on our uh, external walk. Uh, for this walk, you just walk straight ahead here, following the white uh, signs on your right hand side. And now we're going to change levels. We're going to go up to a higher part of the park. Even one. Even one. Come on, Fluffy. Now the park is full of uh, wild garlic at this time of the year, Don. Makes oh, yeah. a very pretty sight. The pesto lovers would love it. <laughs> they would. <laughs> <laughs> or any Italians would love it. <laughs> yeah. We're coming now to one of the ways of getting up to the upper levels uh, in the park. And this might require a little bit of agility from some people, but we suggest it as the best way of getting up to the higher point in the park. Let's go up, Don, and see what we can see up. Okay. I'm going to go this way. <laughs> level of the park and as you can see a path runs from east to west uh, along here and these are very ancient paths they, they were the quickest way to get through the valley and they've been used by many people over many millennia now we're going to see some more interesting features of the park if we walk to the right We're now passing uh, an area called Beach Row. You'll see the entrance point uh, three on the external walk. And these beaches, these beech trees, are some of the finest and oldest in Ireland. They're over 320 years old. And their branches can be seen stretching skyward even from the manor. So these are titans of beech trees planted by Richard Molesworth. Robert Mosworth, of course, you go ahead. So, we call this area Beach Row, and we can see numerous e evidence of stone walling along this part. So here's an early wall with no mortar between it, dates from the 17th, uh, 18th century. You can see all along here was a stone wall, which the roots have now uh, dislodged. We carry on. Is this your normal route? Yeah, Don? if I was going this, if I'm coming this way, this would be my route. I wouldn't go up as steep the path with you went. I would go a little bit more to the right. And okay, you would. A more gentle climb. Oh, you would. <laughs> um, we're coming to another area of beech row, and it's, it, as you can see, magnificent uh, beech trees, all in this particular grove. And just a small story from. Uh, Dan Redmond's book. Dan Redmond lived in the park in the 40s and 50s and um, he was interested one morning the boys in the house they saw men with ladders and ropes and chains up against some of these particular trees and what we're doing they were dislodging cranes which, had, which was ne nesting there and their piercing cries were upsetting the thoroughbred so 
That wasn't a great day for nature, so we walk ahead. Okay, just up from this bank, you don't have to follow me because it's private property, but but up 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 there is a, a, an ornamental canal. It's just nearly half a kilometer long, and um, a, a third of it is in, is in is in private property, so you can't use you can't actually go into here. Um, but you can see the other part of it, the, t the other two thirds, on the walk across from Brookdale. When when I lived up there in, in say from sixty seven, it was three quarters full with water. Up nearest the house didn't hold any water, but it possibly did back in his day. I'm sure it did because he would hardly have a, an ornamental canal if there was no water in it, you know. If, Yes, uh, we're just continuing our walk along a uh, beach row and another magnificent beach street with stone walling uh, beside it. Now there's a few interesting things to see along this path. Let's go along and see them. Magnificent roots of the beech trees, some of the finest uh, in Ireland. can get a little bit mucky here, but well worth the trouble. We'll come to a little hill here. Um, Don, if you can just show the stone walling along this part of the estate. So walls were constructed to surround the estate and obviously to keep out uh, locals as well. And you'll see the white mark for external walk five interest point this is 19th century walling with uh, different mortaring uh, between the flat stones. 18th century doesn't use mortar at all. They're just free, free stones. We'll, we'll walk ahead. <coughs> Pat's sneak, sneak down from various parts of this higher walk. I've caught it again, but I've another bit. We're just going down through. So that's not really high, and the, the walk is well worth the trouble. So don't, please, don't. A lot of pad stones here indicating uh, this is a much used and very ancient uh, route. You'll see its interest mark uh, six on the external route marked with a white. Thank you, Doc. Don. And we walk ahead. So we'll just come back to the uh, high place that we came up through the rope and now we begin the, the outer walk or the walk to Noxidan proper and you'll see it's marked by the, the white dots. Just come ahead with me Don because there's something interesting here. Okay. Right near. So we've just passed one of uh, a particular stone construction here, and this is one of Molesworth's uh, water uh, cascades that he was so proud of and which people came to see from all over the, the country and the world indeed. You'll see it's mounted by 18th century mortar, which doesn't have their dry stone walls. The top of the, fa of the fountain or cascade is slate because they used that for flatness. And when I opened this up the first time, water actually ran through there. So you can imagine the effect of water uh, spooling through here and coming right down on the valley. It's quite an important uh, structure, this. So we've named it on the external walk interest point eight because it has beautiful masonry and they always put beautiful and decorative masonry on both sides of any particular feature that they wanted to draw attention to. We'll walk ahead. What's your experience of walking up here, Don? And well, all different <coughs> weathers and different we did, climates. We didn't really come this way because we had the uh, canal walk there. We, we'd be on the horses there. Uh, this was so, sorry to interrupt you, Don. Just more fine stone walling along here. This is the boundary of Black Brackenstown Estate at the upper level. And we're just coming into some more magnificent uh, beech trees. They're some of, they're some of the finest in Ireland. The ranches uh, stretching skyward, and 
Molesworth admired these trees for their smooth bark and their very nice habit and decorative trees. Thanks, Don. We're, we're walking ahead. So you were saying we see, we see more paths down there for people to explore if they like. But we're yep. going to keep on this particular one okay. so they know exactly where they're going okay. at any one particular time. So we walk ahead. You were saying, Don, that you 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 use another path. Yeah, we we'd be up in the field where the canal is because it was more open and so the horses could have easy access here was sometimes overgrown there could be a fallen tree which the uh, the groundsman would okay here's a choice would... point so we take left here okay Weaving our way through what's now beautiful uh, garlic flowers and growth in the beautiful early month of May. Some fine path stones along here showing it's a well established trail. And just to keep us on track, a white mark for the external walk. We, we walk ahead. Now, because of the invasive uh, cherry laurel plant, it's often uh, quite difficult to get into parts of the park which were once very busy and also inhabited. And Don, you're going to tell us about this particular, what does this pile of rocks mean here? Well, this here is the site of where Jack and Mary McGrath, who used to live in the, in the Brackenstown stables yard uh -huh. in, in the bungalow, uh -huh. but had to move when it was sold, Dr. Cross bought it and he wanted to rent out the stables and he also wanted to rent out the house. So they moved from that house to, to, to this little cottage. Do you and remember it? Oh, I remember the cottage well. Uh, what was it like? Oh, it was, it, was, it was like one of those picture postcards you'd see in Galway. Of, of <laughs> someone with a double door <laughs> looking out. Of the, and we used to walk the horses along that road we'd just been walking along. Yeah, of course. And they'd always give you a wave. Of course. And, uh, but... A happy when, bunch. But when I moved out... In their little house. I, I don't know what happened to the house or when it was knocked or... You, you, you pointed out some interesting holes in the ground here, though. Yes, yes. Uh, have you any theory or I, what I, you think no, they I might did. have been? I don't, I don't think it could have been sewerage. Right. Um, was it water, it, perhaps? It's poss possibly water. We're just looking at this massive piece of uh, what, masonry here. There's a metal... It, you, you, kinda, you could say that was a chimney, but there's, there's a no metal. sign of any soot. Oh, good analysis, my friend. Thank you. We're, we're just on the path here, and this is something new to me, but there's a lot of heritage you can't actually see. But Don here, my good friend and colleague, pointed out, here's the remains of a water well uh, on the estate. Now, water was very important in the 19th century because people had no public water supply and animals also needed it. So remember, this was a working farm and water was very important. So what happens typically with these wells is once their usage is over, they're out of the system, they get covered over, so nobody can fall into it. But if you see the circular rim on the top, there's at least four or five wells dotted throughout the estate. So thanks for pointing that out, Don. So we're just continuing on our walk, and we're, again, we're passing some magnificent beech trees here, which are some of the finest in Ireland, uh, as we said. We're just pausing on our walk to knock the Dan Bridge, just to point out a number of things of interest. If you can see the steep slope that goes down to sea level, which the Ward River is at. Some of, a lot of the houses on this west side of Swords, they're at an elevation of 250 feet. So this is Noxidan Estate, uh, quite recently built, well, within the last 15 years. And there's also an entrance to the park uh, from that particular uh, gate. So, uh, but if you just see the difference in elevation, that we get from ground level where the river is down below and up here it's a unique uh, landscape so don is uh, is very kindly posing uh, for us here in the shot and we just wanted to see the very steep slope that constitutes most of the uh, landscape of this particular area of the park we mentioned in from the geological times that the valley was carved out uh, in the quaternary age and then the Ward River itself smoothed the bank. So what's remarkable about the topography of the Ward Valley is how smooth the banks are. And that's because they're made of clay and they provide an ideal holding ground for 
the roots of plants and that's why we see some fantastic specimens uh, of lovely trees up here and we'll walk ahead. We're, we're just continuing our walk along the upper beach path, path, path is what I call this and just look ahead you, you wouldn't see, see nicer scenery like this anywhere in Ireland and yet it's still so uh, unknown and uh, un undeveloped. Now Don, this looks like an entrance. Uh, would you like to tell us where that goes? This is the middle entrance of, the th of three. There's one down the, the furthest east and there's one furthest west. But this is the middle one and it brings you into Brackenshell, uh, knocks you down the state. When was it built? It was built when the houses yeah, it's 15 well, years or 20 years, is it so? Probably 20 years ago anyway. Yeah, thank you. And just, we don't need to say anything here because you won't see a nicer scene. Some of the kids have put their fairy doors up on the trees. And like the park, like the park, we just see it looks like a missile thrush there yes, on, the, on the ground. You'll see all kinds of flora and fauna in this beautiful area. We're on the upper walk here, but if you look down, you, this is this, one of the steepest parts of it, down to the lower walk. Looks like a lot of fun spot for kids to go down. Oh yeah, yeah. It's a, a nicely wooded area here. Yeah, beautiful, it's beautiful. Knock it, knock it, buddy. Yep, we're up. We're up. So we're, we're now coming to another entrance to the park. And as we were saying, this is Noxidan Estate. And the trees you see ahead, they're oak trees. They would have marked the end of the Manders uh, farm and estate with the R108, the Dublin to Glass, Noxidan to Glass Nevin roads just running slightly over here so we'd like you to know how to access the park and where exactly the entrances are you have something to say Don? yeah i was going to say this this here this was a where all the houses are now was our gallop it was a mile around and this was the finishing you'd come up here you always like to finish up a hill because it, it would test them get them fitter so but yeah, it was, it was, there was no houses, you, it was just a beautiful countryside and... And the horses loved it. We're now coming down to the um, Ward Valley from the Noxedan Estate entrance. And some of the local kids have planted some fairy, fairy doors here. And beside it, uh, some very interesting uh, mushrooms have taken a uh, uh, plant on there. Um, the Ward Valley Estate is famous and has been investigated scientifically for its store of mushrooms and fungi. It seems the climate here is ideal. We're stepping now into one of probably the best known areas of the park. Um, bridges you usually define the park and here is the entrance to one of the major bridges uh, from this area. We see a path just going here. We're going to take that path on our second uh, turn around and the river here is down below. Um, Don tells me it was used for eventing at different times. Yeah, well, Equestrian after, eventing. After the racing stables finished, uh, it was a it was a riding school, and I think they did a three day eventing. So that was one of the excellent, excellent. things they. Thanks, Tom. Uh, White mark for the external walk. We're just walking ahead. and bulwarks for the uh, for Noxidan Bridge. Uh, these are limestone blocks. Um, we know the bridge was built between 1831 and 1832 by William Don uh, Campbell. And this sort of buttressing is very unusual, very expensive to make, 
and time consuming also but it shows you how strong the bridge as constructed is and you'll see it's one of the external wall marks as marked there we just walk the head thank you god we're on the path we're on the path down to noxodam bridge today and noxodam bridge defines the western boundary of the estate Noxidan Bridge is hugely strong and built in 1831, it hasn't had any changes made to it since, though it carries a hugely greater load of traffic. It's massively built with buttressing uh, on both sides. This part of the park has been used quite a lot over the ages and if you see here it's an external walk uh, 20. This is an embarkation stone into the river. And there would have been a tripod, a metal tripod on both of those. The water levels would be hugely greater than now. And it was for genteel boating uh, on the river. Now, an interesting point about Molesworth's work within the park is, Molesworth built a diversion to the Ward River to bring water right up to his pumping house and to be uh, splayed then across the estate. And this is part of this, the walling that uh, Molesworth built. This is from the 1720s. Uh, no mortar between them, just dry stone lining and still looking uh, quite well, though taken over a lot by nature. And now we're under Noxidan Bridge. And we won't go in. Um, we can't go in. I can. <laughs> so, please. So, Noxidan Bridge built 1831 to 82. The bridge was built to replace an older rickety structure. Um, and the engineer who built it said, we're constructing this to stop the people falling down deep precipices and ravines. So, this part of Fingal is a very deep chasm. And a way had to be found to get people over the bridge. If you look across at the masonry over there, you can see the remains of the original bridge, which was much smaller and a much more rickety structure. Also, a bridge was necessary for the Turnpike Road, which also took the post and other commercial business from Glasnevin uh, to Drogheda would have been the route. Now, interestingly, on one of the Ordnance Survey maps, I discovered that there was a road underneath Noxidan Bridge, an actual road. It's now taken over, but it's mentioned in a lot of the uh, publications of the day. Let's walk ahead. Coming now to the Metal Bridge, uh, which is the most westerly bridge in the park. And it would have been a crossing here from time immemorial. If you just look there, you can see the deep channel for, for Molesworth's uh, watery diversion. It's quite clear there. As we, as we walk across the bridge, the estate begins to open up and you can see how open it is in various places. This, this is a, a view of uh, Noxidan Bridge from the northern side. It's just as when you're on the, the southern side, the trees block the view of it somewhat. But um, it's what's a, your impression of the bridge? It, oh, it's a magnificent. When you think of when it was built and how strong it is, and it's still here without any work being done to it since then. I mean, There's, it's. Um, the memorial up there uh, with a hurley on it, was this the meeting point, point for people in 1916 from Sword? Yes. Is that commemorated up there? I think so, yeah. yeah. That's the meeting point for the rising. Yeah. 
just behind me here is, is a, the remains of a Norman Mott and, and Bailey. We'll, we'll return to where we were, back over the bridge again. We're keeping the, keeping the river on our, on our left. So Don has just gone in and he's going to point out a very interesting bit of heritage which is easily uh, missed along this particular uh, path. Um, what have we got here, Don? This is, we think it molds what, he, he built a channel from the, the river, he diverted it through here, and this was a crossing. And you can see the little bridge, it's, it's not very wide, it only goes to, to here. Yeah, sort of an ornamental bridge. Ornamental bridge, yeah. Is it like there's another big brick bridge, I think, at the other end of the estate? Are there similarities between both yeah, of those? Well, they're both made of bricks, I think, yes, are they? Yeah, definitely they're both made of bricks. Um, I'm not sure from what. Uh, and we can see the water still in it. It's still yes, quite oh, yeah. wet down there. Oh, yeah. So this is a bit of heritage that needs to be excavated well, uh, and preserved. So this part of the lower uh, beach walk, you can see it's very well uh, shot, uh, shot with, with, with stones and this is because you have to remember this was a working estate and wheel, wheels and carts would have rumbled over these uh, smaller stones and they give a much firmer surface to traffic uh, moving along what we call the lower path and if you can see how wide the path is often there's a tendency in the path for vegetation to encroach so the paths we see now are a lot smaller than they would have been originally but here we see the full size of a path through the estate almost enough that two carriages could pass on either side. Thanks, Don. Perfect. Now, the more, hold please, the more we study this, the Ward River, the more we're, we're learning about its dynamics and what happens. All these stones have been brought down by the river and smaller stones on, on the banks and larger stones to, to the front. The river was and still is even today a very dynamic and powerful force. And a lot of the work we've seen has been to maintain the water within its banks with, with that very great power which can productively be used to drive mills and, and water wheels. And just here we have a fairly typical entrance onto the river. You can see the stones are allowing for for grip and you have to imagine that the water would probably have been up to this particular level rather than six or seven feet below it today. We'll just walk ahead on, thank you. Again, there's an interaction always between the river and uh, its, it, it, its uh, environments. So sometimes we see erosion, we see stones actually in the bank, but a lot of these stones have been placed here in order to adry, allow access uh, to the river below, usually for watering cattle or other kinds of beasts. So this area here is nice and dry and very firm to, to work with. We walk ahead. Um, just to be aware that our walks, the river can sometimes be close or it can be very far away from the path. And along this road, we'll be coming to an area where the river comes very close to the path and we'll see what they had to do to try and give themselves uh, dry, dry land to walk on. It's a little bit muddy here. Again, a lovely entrance into the park and down to the river. You'll see nice uh, firm stones here and other pat stones to make sure that the animals or the people could walk through there in safety.
important interaction and intersection between various paths. As you see, this one comes down from the upper beach path down to this particular path. And if you look just here, this was another way on through the river and out into the countryside. We have to remember that the, the, the Heritage Park was very much part of the local communities, routes and they had paths throughout the park which, would, which were efficient, straight and dry. And this is the entrance to one of those with the white, for, white mark for the external wall. saying the, the river sometimes is near and sometimes very far from the path. So here we have a good example of a water meadow. Um, I've taken soil samples from this particular area and it's all silt. So the river definitely flooded up to this particular area even though its banks today are very far over. So this is a typical water meadow from the Heritage Park. interesting feature on the lower beach walk and this is the remains of a gravel pit we're saying that the, air, the soil here is very rich in limestones and all kinds of boulders so that's why stone heritage is so important here if you look at the top you can see large boulders uh, poking out from it so masons had a ready supply of buildable uh, material and this this gravel pit would have been to draw stones and gravel for, for the various uh, works that were going on and around the park and provided uh, a, so an income stream for either Richard Manders or other later uh, entrepreneurs. And we were saying at this point, the river is quite close. And the water meadows are on the other side of the, uh, the river here. It's quite low running today, Don, you've seen it at oh, higher levels. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you tell me about some of the most strongest floods well, that you've seen from the river, Ward? Just back up the way, uh, Cluffy, as, as you know, um, he's with me all the time. But one day he went in to get a drink further up and he just got washed away with the current. Oh so he swam to the opposite side. Whoa, he's a good swimmer, Cluffy the dog. Well, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a clever lad. But he he swam to the other side and he he just kind of, he took one attempt to cross back and he was washed down again. So he went back to where he was. I rang my daughter. She came down. She lives in Ridgewood. And she came down and stood to talk to him while I went up the other side. You had to go. I had to go across the other side of the river over the bridge and manoeuvred my way down to him. He, to he's, him. he's your baby. Oh, yeah. And he, you wanted to keep him safe. He was cute enough that he knew I'm not going that way. Uh, thank you. Um, we were saying that the river runs close to the paths at some times and then very far away at other times. But you can take it that the river used to flood up to this particular path and it was so bad that people developed another upper path to take them away from the wet area. And this path runs along for a few hundred yards. You can see the river is quite near to it. Um, they never built anything that wasn't of use or was, was practically useful. So the upper path here runs along, they're dry dry shot, it continues along and the river is right beside up here. It's continuing along. Um, I put an interest point here because this is a way of either coming down or either going up onto the path. Uh, it's called external walk interest point uh, 12 and this is typically a style how a style would be built take people up from muddy ground 
up onto a drier surface. We'll just walk ahead. still alongside us and as we come along here if you can just film in there then there's a natural bank here which makes an end to this uh, drier ground and there's many path stones up along there so the takeaway message from that particular construction is the Ward River was a powerful stream in its day and time So we're now finished the external walk and um, the route we've taken today was across the little core walk path that, that, that we took at the first walk and um, we just want to say a, a great thank you for accompanying both Don and myself on, on our walks here. We hope to post up uh, these videos uh, in YouTube so that people can avoid any pitfalls and enjoy their walk to the full. So it's goodbye from me. Goodbye from him. <laughs>